Welcome uh, to the second Humanities Forum event of the semester, um, Scales to Scalpels. I'm going to introduce one of our performers this afternoon, uh, Professor Leisha Carlson, and she's going to introduce uh, our other uh, guest for today. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Leisha Carlson of Providence College's Department of Philosophy. Professor Carlson was trained in music and in philosophy as an undergraduate at Vassar College and in philosophy as a master's and doctoral student at the University of Toronto. Her first book, The Faces of Intellectual uh, Disability, Philosophical Reflections, stirred wide interest and received high acclaim across branches of philosophical and religious studies. She has edited collections on both the philosophy of disability and on philosophy of the arts, published widely on both subjects and on their intersection, especially in music performance. Professor Carlson has complemented theory at the highest level with practice just as impressive. This is her sixth season playing with the Longwood Symphony Orchestra in Boston. She has belonged to community orchestras in Seattle and Toronto and plays chamber music whenever she gets a chance. Professor Carlson joined the Providence College faculty uh, the year I did in 2009. In the 10 years since meeting her, my admiration has only grown while my feelings of intimidation have almost been mitigated by her extraordinary graciousness as a colleague and friend and teacher. Please join me in welcoming Professor Alicia Carlson. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and welcome everybody. Thank you for choosing to spend your sunny Friday afternoon here um, with us. I also wanna thank Raymond and Eric and everyone who puts together the Humanities Forum, which is a wonderful um, series of events throughout the year and I think complements our mission and our commitment to interdisciplinarity. Um, and the humanities across all other disciplines. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker and performer today, Dr. Lisa Wong. Dr. Wong is a physician and musician dedicated to lifelong learning and healing through the arts. An international speaker on arts and health, she is a co-founder of the Arts and Humanities Initiative at Harvard Medical School and the Boston Arts Consortium for Health. She has fostered conversation and collaboration between leaders passionate about the arts and healing from most of Boston's major music, health, and educational institutions and beyond. Lisa served as president of the Longwood Symphony Orchestra for over 20 years and led the LSO to create its Healing Art of Music program that raises funds and awareness for Boston-based medical nonprofit organizations. She is affiliated with several arts and health organizations locally and nationally, and she serves on the boards of Conservatory Lab Charter School, New England Foundation for the Arts, and a far cry, which is a self-governed, self-conducted string orchestra. An assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Wong has practiced at Milton Pediatrics for 34 years and is delighted to be caring for her second generation of parents which is very sweet <laughs> to think about. Um, she received an honorary degree in education from Wheelock College in 2016 and was a 2014 visiting scholar in arts in education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Her first book, Scales to Scalpels, Doctors Who Practice the Healing Arts of Music and Medicine, which is about the Longwood Symphony Orchestra, along with being about many other things, um, came out in 2012. Having attended Harvard University, NYU School of Medicine, and trained at Massachusetts General Hospital for Children, she's currently teaching an undergraduate course at Harvard College on the role of music in education and health. On a personal note, um, I have had the privilege of knowing Dr. Wong since I joined the Longwood Symphony. Um, and I can say without hesitation that she is probably the most active engaged, engaging, prolific person that I know. Um, I'm hoping that by playing duets with her, some of her energy will somehow be transferred to me. Um, we've been stand partners 
at the Longwood Symphony, and I, I'm hoping that playing in this context, I can also, through musical osmosis, um, gain some of her wisdom and her poise and her generosity with her time and all of her talents. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Lisa, Dr. Lisa Wong. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, coming out, and thank you to the uh, Humanities Forum. This is really uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful gathering and a wonderful um, mission for this, and I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. So uh, before we um, get into my talk, Lisha and I are going to play together. We're playing uh, the first movement of the Mozart duo in G major for violin and viola. I'll switch later to the violin, um, and the interesting the interesting tidbit about this is Mozart wrote this for his friend Michael Haydn. Michael had been commissioned to write six um, duos for the Archduke, and he only finished four, and then he got sick. And so um, Mozart, under the guise of Michael Haydn, wrote these two other pieces to complete the commission. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, recommend this to students to do this for their friends. <laughs> But, but one, what, what I was going to say actually is, this is just such a lovely uh, way to start. I think I've been having so much fun rehearsing with Leisha. Um, what you'll hear is um, there will be ideas that are going to be generated from one person, and then another will echo them, or vice versa. And, um, and so working together, we augment each other and make um, music. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thanks a lot for being such a great audience. Um, 
it's a very interesting thing to be switching back and forth from communicating through words and communicating through an instrument. Um, so, so thank you for being an audience for both. So I just um, want to thank you again for, for being here. And I just wanted to share some of my thoughts about um, what my journey has been in, um, in music and education and, and health and service. So one of my guiding stars is Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Um, how many of you have heard of Dr. Schweitzer? I'm sure in this in a humanities forum, this is a, this is a good this is a good thing. Um, but he was a musician and a theologian and a philosopher. And at the age of 30, he heard about the healthcare disparities in Equatorial Africa and uh, decided that he was going to then go um, back to study. And so he became a a doctor, he went to medical school, and, in, and when he was 38, he moved to uh, what is the country now known as Gabon. Um, and what he said is, I decided to make my life my argument. Um, he wanted to work with his hands and express himself in service with his hands and um, advocate for the things that he believed in, which was the central, the central belief was the reverence for all life. So um, 100 years later, his hospital still is uh, there in, in Gabon. They actually don't use these facilities. They have kept it as a museum, and they have a, a hospital next door. But um, not only was he writing articles about tropical medicine and um, um, care of people in Africa, but he, was, he had also made sure that he brought his instrument. He brought his piano. Um, and when the hospital was running out of money, he would go back to Europe and play concerts on the organ to raise money to um, fund his hospital. And so, you see, there are there are lots of parallels there with the work that um, I've been I've been dedicating my life to, um, and so the Longwood Symphony is the orchestra that Licia and I are both affiliated with. It was started in the middle '80s, um, and it was it's a an orchestra. It's a community orchestra of very high level uh, musicians from mainly from the healthcare professions, and so it's actually one of the only places in the city where you can find. Um, a collaboration in harmony of so many uh, academic inst institutions playing together and not necessarily arguing with each other about, about anything, but really uh, working together for common purpose. And um, some of my colleagues have been there, like me, for over 30 years. Uh, we've st we started when we were residents, and some have started as medical students and just continue to stay there uh, because it feeds our soul as, as musicians and also um, gives us a sense of purpose. Um, so what Schweitzer said was, one thing I know is the only ones among you who will be truly happy are those who have sought and found a way to serve. And this was true for those of us in the Longwood Symphony. In the first number of years, for, really for the first seven years, our, our purpose was just to become excellent. We, um, for me, my, my husband is a professional violinist, and we were playing on the same Jordan Hall stage as my, my husband's ensembles, and we didn't sound that good yet. And so um, that was one of our focuses as, as musicians, but also as physicians who are striving for excellence. The orchestra had to be that way too, and so we, we strove to accomplish that. Um, but that wasn't enough. We felt like there was something missing. And so fortunately, in 1991, when I became uh, president of the orchestra, it coincided with some very happy um, collaborations. And one of them was that the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship uh, had decided that they were going to expand their work into the city of Boston. So the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship, until then, was based at Harvard Medical School. And they would send a couple of medical students to, uh, to Gabon, to Africa, to work for three months. In, in Schweitzer's hospitals, and they would come back transformed. And some of them are still the leaders of community medicine uh, in, our, in our community now. And when they got to this point in 1991, it was their 20th anniversary, and they said, if Schweitzer lived in Boston, what would he do here? And we started to think about what the healthcare disparities and healthcare challenges were for us in 1991, and they were HIV AIDS, homelessness, domestic violence, and chil children's health care disparities. Uh, unfortunately, I'm realizing that we haven't moved that far forward in some of these. But what they did was, so Yo-Yo is a, a friend of both the Schweitzer Fellowship. He's a personal friend. And he said, well, you know, if you're going to do something on Schweitzer, the Longwood Symphony would be the perfect match of physicians who are playing music. And so we had two days of conferences all over our city 
um, bringing the leaders of, um, who are doing research on AIDS and the homelessness uh, leaders. And each of these groups were pulled together with their staff, with their academic leaders, as well as their clients and patients. And so we had brown bag lunches and meetings in every public space we could find. So we were in the Boston Public Library, the YMCA, uh, the Old South Meeting House, every place that we could. We all met together and talked about these, these challenges. Uh, we also spoke on Bach because Schweitzer was a, is, is, was a Bach specialist and wrote a couple of books on that. And then we also focused on his philosophy on reverence for life. And uh, the culmination of these two days was to have a concert at the Jordan Hall, which is our second largest concert hall, and it's, where it's the home of the Longwood Symphony. And rather than selling tickets, we had the tickets underwritten so that we could give these tickets to our colleagues uh, who were doing this work. And so we reserved spots across the hall, and the whole concert hall was, of course, sold out because Yo-Yo was playing with us. And, and we looked out uh, at the audience just before we started, and we saw two empty spots two whole sections of empty spots. And later asked, well, what was it that was causing that? And it was the area of, of um, the homeless, because our concert was going to go past 10 o'clock, and they would lose their beds. And then uh, the women who were victims of violence would not come to a public space in a group. And so we, at that moment, saw our own blind spot. and. Um, the, the orchestra actually was transformed because this was an orchestra of healthcare providers feeling pretty good about themselves that we were playing a concert for Schweitzer and we realized that we had not been listening to our patients, which is uh, our audience. And so from then on, uh, we changed our model and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But I want to step back for a moment to think about um, this whole interesting phenomenon of music and medicine and healing. It's not a new concept. Um, Apollo, in, in fact, was the Greek god of the sun and truth, but also of healing and also of music. And if you see on his, on, in this statue, he's leaning on his musical lyre, and he's balanced that on a caduceus, which is the, 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 the rod and the snake, which is the sign of, um, of medicine. And then moving on through history, we have Alexander Borodin, who was a colleague of Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov, but he didn't write as much music as the others because he was busy as a professor in chemistry, and he also was the founder of the St. Petersburg School of Medicine for Women. So he was doing that and writing music on the side. And René Lenec, who was an accomplished flutist, made his own flutes out of wood and started listening through his, his flute sideways and invented a stethoscope. So I heard that you're thinking about inter interdisciplinarity here. And so I think Providence College is really far ahead in this, in this area that we really need to be thinking that because we're doctors, it doesn't mean we can't be pianists or violinists. Because we're humanists, it doesn't mean that we can't also think about science. So all of these things come together. And um, my friends in design thinking talk about divergent thinking. But uh, to see from divergent points of view, we have to think creatively and use all the different aspects of our lives, because that's who we are as people. So my way of looking at divergent thinking is the things that really feed divergent thinking is our creativity, our aspiration to excellence, and our resilience to keep going round and round and round and building on, a, on that. And, um, a similar circle is something that I learned at the Graduate School of Education, which is the eight studio habits of mind. And this is what they use to think about how to promote arts education for children. But we're always children until, you know, we, psychologically, I think we, we'll, I'm, I'm always going to be young until, until I'm no longer living. Um, but if we go through this, you can see how you can start at any point and really find yourself going back around the circle. What do the arts do for the way we think about things? We learn how to express ourselves, and then we have to develop a craft to express that. It could be visual art, it can be poetry, it can be music. Uh, we have to envision what we're going to do to really accomplish the art that we're, we're, um, 
we're, we're striving for. It helps us to understand our community. We also understand that we need to be in community with others. We observe, we engage, we persist to make it happen, and then we stop and reflect and start all over again. So I think m most of you have probably heard of Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 Hours, and he quoted that from uh, Dr. Anders Ericsson, who's written an interesting book um, that was basically saying, no, it's not just 10,000 hours. It's not 10,000 hours of nothing. It really has to be 10,000 hours of quality, of persistence, and, and aspiration to excellence. And he studied chess players, musicians, surgeons. Um, and you, know, you can put in the time, but if your mind isn't in it, then you're not really engaged. When I was down in um, North Carolina, I found this wonderful quote on the wall of the City of Medicine Academy. It's a, a pilot, a public pilot school um, for uh, students who are interested in healthcare. Uh, we are what we repeatedly do. So excellence is not an act, but a habit. Excellence can be practiced, and excellence is something to aspire to. Similarly with resilience, um, it takes all of these aspects to really achieve the resilience that we want to have in our students, in ourselves, um, to keep on going back and thinking about topics and start to think really deeply. And if you put them all together, you can see how uh, these attributes are the things that will really help us to, to overcome challenges and to persist and to grow. And so to be creative, we need to use all of these things. Um, and have divergent points of view. Both of these images are beautiful. One of them is covered, but you can enjoy the, the trees in front of it. And, and um, this is a Chihuly, actually. I was thinking about this, too. And Chihuly himself had several tragedies in his life. He lost his brother when he was 15, and he lost his father when he was 18. And then he lost his eye in an in a, in a accident so that he could no longer be the one making the glass, um, but still he's, he's now 77 and he remains a glass artist, one of the most famous glass artists in the world, um, and he teaches others to do the glass for him, but he continues to envision it. So that got me thinking about how it is that musicians and artists grow up to be healthcare providers and um, because that's my world, and I've met so many people. How, how is it that there are Longwood symphonies all over the world? How is it that there are enough people to, to field the Longwood symphony, and we have a waiting list of 15 or 20 uh, musicians waiting to get in? So for that, I, we pulled together a, a, a very interdisciplinary group, physicians, neuroscientists, musicians, music therapists. What is it about music and healing that pulls us all together? And so I'm going to dabble a little bit in some neuroscience, and I won't go very deep because I'm a general pediatrician, so I don't, I have to admit, I don't know as much as my neuroscientific uh, colleagues. But when you think about what you were watching when, when Leisha and I were playing, what were we using? What part of our brain were we using? Is there a single place in our brain that was being used? No, because we were using our gross motor, we're using our fingers, we're using our eyes, we're using our ears, we're engaged, and we were responding to you. So there's all of those kinds of things. So let's break that down a little bit. And as a pediatrician, you know, we study different parts of how a child develops. And so I'll go through the, the three major ones, which is uh, motor development and uh, speech and socio, um, social emotional learning. So what does it take to be a child who's learning music? And what kinds of things are engaged when a child is le learning music? There's different parts of our brain that are being used. Does anybody have some suggestions, ideas, of what parts of our brain we are being used when we're playing music? All of them. Yes. The motor cortex. And so that's right. The motor cortex is, is up along here. It's telling our, our hands to go up and down or our bows to go this way. Our fine motor is for our fingers to go this way. And also, if you're a pianist, to coordinate where your hands are going. What other parts of the brain? Yeah. Yes. 
Exactly. So the occipital lobe is our vision center, and that's, you know, when you talk about your eyes are in the back of your head, it, it really is true. Um, and that's where the visual cortex is. And looking at music, looking at Leisha when I'm playing, uh, looking out at the audience, um, and envisioning how the music is, even if you're playing by memory. What other parts of the brain? Yeah. The part, parietal lobe for articulation, and, um, and what was the other? And dynamics, yes. The parietal lobe is, is over here, and it's thinking about uh, the nuances of music. Great. And there's even more. So when we think of the, so the motor cortex is here. Um, down here, below the occipital lobe, is the cerebellum, which is the little brain. And the cerebellum is our rhythm section. And so even when babies haven't learned to speak yet, when you play music, does anybody have a small child or a small grandchild? You play music and they start bopping their heads. That's, that's, that's their occipital lobe and their brainstem already understanding that there's rhythm. We need that rhythm to be able to walk and to be able to clap our hands and, and to play music in, in time with each other. And, so, and, and then in language, I'll let it go that way since it wanted to, um, there's two sec sections of, of our brain that, use, um, that we use for language. One is for understanding language, the Wernicke's area, so what we hear um, when we're in, when, what we hear, it goes to Wernicke's area to interpret. If we want to say something about it, it goes out to the expressive language. And so, um, when you have children, there are some babies who learn to babble very early on, and they say all kinds of words and have no idea what they're talking about. And then there are other babies who are very quiet, and you can talk to them and they'll nod their heads and they'll go and you say, go get the, the, the ball and they'll go and get it. And they'll understand, but they don't have yet their expressive language. So it's when you bring those two things together that you have um, communication. And these two are connected inside the brain by something called the arcuate fasciculus. And um, we find that the, our neuroscientist uh, colleagues find that the, the arcuate fasciculus is actually thicker in uh, people who play music because they're expressing themselves all the time. And, and uh, there's just, they're, because they're just, they use that part of the brain more, there's, there are more tracks in that, that part of the information highway. Yes, with receptive language in music, we're listening to rhythms, we're hearing patterns, we're listening to pitches, we're fine tuning the pitches, tonal differences, timbre differences. Uh, we're surprised by silence, we're surprised by surprise, by a, a, a key that we didn't expect to happen. And all of those things are uh, going on when we're playing music or listening to music. And in, express, in expressing it, um, Leisha and I had a great time actually rehearsing because we had some differences and um, we, we tried different ways of shall we crescendo all the way to the end of this phrase or shall we echo this phrase because it sounds like that phrase. And when you do it in two different ways, neither is right or wrong necessarily, but one of them feels, feels like it works better than the other. And that's what rehearsing is. And it's, it's that conversation that is, is so rich. Um, most music is memorized. And so it's always astonishing to me the pianists who have memorized 30 or 40 piano concertos. And those concertos last for 30 or 40 minutes each. Um, and they know every single note. Also what's interesting is their fellow musicians will say, oh, he missed that F sharp in the middle of the in the middle of this this forty minute piece, but um, that's that's how developed um, musical language is. What's been interesting is there are um, neuroscientists now who are prospectively studying what um, music is doing for children starting at the age of six before they start music, and what uh, this particular study they are now in year six. The children are middle schoolers and um, they've. They're tracking their auditory processing. They're tracking um, the changes in their brain by MRI. And they're finding that the children who are um, musically trained, their brains are different and their activities are different than children who are age matched, uh, who are playing soccer, and age, other children who are age matched who don't have any, um, any after school activities. And these are all children in the same demographic area in Los Angeles. 
So this long longitudinal study is very exciting, and uh, there's some more to come because I think, uh, especially in these times when, when there's financial issues in schools, the first thing they tend to do is to cut the music programs, and um, they may be actually damaging our our math and science programs by uh, and and shortchanging the doctors by cutting the music programs. And so the most important one that I think is social emotional learning. Um, it uses all different parts of the brain, but it also is the part where teachers and colleagues and friends uh, count in the most. Um, you're patterning with, um, with the people who are teaching you. Uh, the, the children who are learning music are asked to do something that a lot of people are not asked to do otherwise, which is to play a piece of music, and they're challenged to play it happy, or they're challenged to play it sad. Play it, play it sound, play this music like it sounds like it's lonely. I mean, these are uh, big challenges for young people to take an abstract emotion and look at a, two notes on a, or a, a, black notes on a page, translating that into their instrument and then into an emotion. And that kind of challenge is what really is developing the whole brain. Besides the modulation of, of uh, emotions, there's resilience. Because you messed up the note, you can start all over again and do it again, like we, we demonstrated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll do that again for the second piece, too. <laughs> There's persistence, you know, re, um, the just practicing, rehearsing, getting it right for the, for the purpose of just getting it right. Um, and no other reward than that. And cooperation, taking turns, you heard that in the music collaboration, and communication between peers. Uh, Dr. Laurel Trainer does work with kids up in uh, Canada. This is a fun little study. What they did was um, they had little babies, and their, their, um, their, uh, their lab, lab um, instructors were, had the babies in a little bouncy thing. And they had music playing, and so they bounced the baby uh, in time to the music. These are toddlers. and so. Half of the kids got to bounce in time to the music that the listener, the, the examiner, and the baby were hearing. And the other half, the examiner had a, headphones on, was listening to a different set of music. So they were bouncing out of synchrony to what the baby was hearing. And interestingly, what they did then was they would put something on the ground, and the baby would, the babies who were in synchrony with, with their um, examiner would pick up the thing and give it back to their uh, examiner. The babies who were out of sync didn't didn't really respond. So, so it's very early learning of, um, of, of working in, in, in parallel and working in, in concert with each other. This is, can be done for children who have disabilities. Uh, it's done for children. This is a uh, kid's note in North Carolina. It's an El Sistema program where um, children from, from um, impoverished backgrounds come together and they learn this kind of collaboration and cooperation together uh, to play music. So in medicine, we can take all of these things, knowing that music does that, we can use it to apply um, our knowledge to therapeutic, to, to, for, for therapeutic means. For example, in um, knowing that music and memory come together and that if I say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, did you hear the tune? It's there in your, in your mind. And what we've we found, even with patients with Alzheimer's who've lost their ability to generate new ideas and lost their ability to speak, if you play music for them of the time that, usually in their 20s, they'll stand up and sing the whole thing. That, that is the last thing that leaves. So um, a, a lot of music is used um, in, in senior centers and, and memory loss centers. Um, for motor planning and movement, because the cerebellum is usually intact, patients with Parkinson's can walk better with their hearing, listening to music. Um, with sound discrimination, we're finding that children who are trained in music may be better when they're trying to learn, if, even if they have dyslexia, because they've learned to um, parse out different pitches and sounds. Um, executive function we talked about. Um, and so you can see that using all of these different Modalities, knowing music, we can apply that in education and in health. 
So I want to go back and talk a little bit more about uh, the Longwood Symphony and how we decided to then live in the Schweitzer spirit. Having learned about, um, about what we had been missing in our musical playing, you know, we were playing at a very high level and we still do, but having figured out that we needed to do something more um, as caregivers, we followed what Schweitzer said, which is the, the one thing I know is the only ones among you who will be truly happy are those who have sought and found a way to serve. We found that when we looked out in that audience and found um, that we had, we, had been, we had not been thinking about our patients, we had not been thinking about the, um, the fact that our homeless would need to go back to their, to their homeless centers, we stopped and said, okay, how are we going to reach our patients where they're at? And our patients are our audience. Uh, so we decided to start something called the Healing Art of Music program. And that went through a bunch of iterations because initially you think, I'm gonna play a concert, I'm gonna give all the money to the organization. The organization says, thank you very much. Who's our next donor? What was your name? And there's no connection there. And for us, as, as, a, as a nonprofit organization, we actually had fixed expenses that we needed to also make. Um, we, had, we had to pay our conductor, we had to pay for the hall. So what we learned was collaborating was really the way to go. So uh, by collaborating with the healthcare organizations, we went to each of them as patients and said, what is it that we can do as an organization that will help you? And it was very interesting because each of them had different reasons to want to be collaborating with us, and it helped us empower them uh, to continue. Um, this is another thing I found on the wall at the City of Music, uh, City of Medicine Academy. Tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I will understand. So what we did was we started working with all these different organizations. Each concert is dedicated to one of these organizations. There's about eight weeks between each concert. And we work with those organizations and say, well, what is it that you'd like to do? So for example, Dimmick Community Health Center is um, one of the big community health centers in our Boston area. And they were starting a program for teen mothers and their mentors. And they said, well, maybe we can bring the mentors and the teen mothers to a concert, to something different for them. And for us, that was, that was huge because Roxbury and, and Jordan Hall's where Jordan Hall is, are very close to each other. They're maybe a mile apart. But to the people who live in Roxbury, it could be on a different planet. Um, so, so being given the opportunity and permission to come into our space and hear us playing a concert with their mentors, getting all dressed up, was treating not only the, on that level, the, the teen mom, but also helping the organization. Um, but there are other, other organizations that wanted to do other things. Um, let's see, well, Partners in Health, for example. At the time that we worked with them, the, it was before the Haiti um, earthquake, and so people didn't know who Partners in Health were, even though they were doing such wonderful work in both Rwanda and Haiti. Um, so they just said, you know, we'd like the other doctors on, in, on the Harvard Medical School to know we exist. So they, that's what they did. They invited uh, people from our medical school community to come to the concert. And then actually right after that, a year later is when the, uh, the earthquake in Haiti happened and we put on another concert then and everyone came together um, in the community that Jordan Hall gave us the space. Um, many other musicians volunteered their services. The orchestra came together to play an extra concert and we raised about $100,000 that day for them. So each, each relationship just continues to build. At the same time, we wanted to make sure that we were treating our musicians. Um, our musicians are young doctors, young medical students who want to know where, how they can serve. And so uh, there are opportunities for them to play in, um, in healthcare settings. As I mentioned, some of them have become music neurologists and music neuroscientists. Um, and uh, many of the medical students want to know how they can use their music to serve. A few years ago, Leisha and I actually played uh, at the Mother's Day Walk for Peace. This is a, a very uh, moving program for the mothers who have lost children to gunshot violence. And they, they march from Roxbury 
to City Hall, and along the way uh, at the bus stops are different musical performances. So Leisha and I uh, played music as, as people came by, and each of us is given uh, the picture of one of these, uh, the victims. And so the family actually came and saw us and took pictures with us and, and listened to us play for a little while as they walked along. Um, I, um, and actually, so the next one that's coming up is on October 5th. We're playing a concert for um, IPPNW, which is the International S uh, Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And this actually was, ties us back to Schweitzer because when Schweitzer got his Nobel Peace Prize, um, he, spoke, he used that platform to speak about um, nuclear war. But I just want to use my last few minutes to talk about uh, something more local for me, the Arts and Humanities Initiative at Harvard Medical School, which was started about five years ago. Um, these are my colleagues, and what happened was, these are just wonderful colleagues that I've worked with. Um, Dr. Goffberg works in, the, in visual art, and Suzanne Coven is a writer, and, and Raphael is a, a poet. But I would sit down with them and say, well, why do you spend all your time writing poetry? And and Dr. Dr. Um, Campbell would say, because it makes me a better doctor. And I'd say, well, why do you spend so much time in the galleries? Oh, because it makes me a better doctor. Why do you spend so much time making art? Because it makes me a better doctor. And we all thought, stopped and said, oh, we're all in the arts because of how it informs our way of caring for our patients. Why don't we come together and do this together? And so we started the Arts and Humanities Initiative at Harvard Medical School. It's um, still a work in progress, but my main goal for that at the beginning was to give permission to our students not to give up their arts. Because most, most students who come into the healthcare professions are already artists. Uh, usually it's about 60 or 70 percent are musicians, which is why the Longwood Symphony is so uh, well populated by medical students. Um, but many of them go home and write poetry or do art. And we want to give them permission to not give that up. Because I think a lot of young people still think, if I'm going to be a doctor, I have to be, I have to be a scientist and forget all of that silly art stuff. And it's, it's completely not true. So um, what do the arts do in medical education? It helps promote empathy, uh, collaboration, resilience, creativity, um, being comfortable with ambiguity, looking at art and realizing that everybody is interpreting that piece of art differently but can come to a consensus, that's being comfortable with ambiguity. And what we find is coming to medical school, to get through that narrow canal of getting to medical school, you have to have done a lot of multiple choice exams. And you, had, uh, you come in with an impression that everything is black and white. Science is the way, and, and, it's, and it's, it's only one way. There's only one answer. And when we find in medicine, of course, that it's never that way. Um, a nine-month-old with, with pneumonia is not the same as a nine-year-old with pneumonia is not the same as a 90-year-old with pneumonia. They still have the same diagnosis, but the treatment is different. And there's, there's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of soft, um, soft things that we have to consider. Bifocalism, which is just my favorite since that's what I have, um, the ability to look in small amounts and big at the same time. Always. Um, so you heard that in our music. Every single 16th note matters, but the entire arc of the musical piece also matters. And so we can't telescope and tell you how it's going to end at the very beginning. And also, we can't be thinking, oh, uh, how, am I going to make that note at the end? Because then we'll drop all the notes in the beginning. So being able to bounce back and forth in bifocalism is exactly what we do in medicine all the time. If I have a child that I've just diagnosed with diabetes, for example, I'm not going to say, OK, and then in 30 years, you're going to have to watch out for um, all of these things with your eyes. You can't telescope all of that to them. But you have to meet them at the spot that they're at while you're also giving them information um, forward in a, in a balanced sort of way. So music, art, all of those things, are um, they help each other. So what have we offered our medical students? We're not curricular yet. And um, there are some medical schools across the country that are requiring uh, arts and humanities as an elective or a selective for, um, for their students for their second years before they go to the hospitals, which is awesome. 
but we're not there yet. Um, but we bring in speakers. Uh, we take our, our students to the museum to look at a piece of art together for 30 minutes. And Dr. Katz, who was in the previous um, image there, he actually does something where he brings an entire ward from the Brigham and Women's Hospital to, um, to the galleries for the evening. He'll get coverage for that ward. And so it's the attending, the social worker, the nurse, the medical student, the attending, uh, the, the senior residents, all of them are together looking at a piece of art. And what they realize is they all have equal opinions and they all may have questions about the same piece of art. And so when they go back to the wards, they hear each other a little bit better and it's not as hierarchical. We allow them to also make art because we ex express ourselves through our hands. Um, the students themselves are the ones who are doing these dance. They have, once a year, have a two-hour dance program, uh, which is amazing. And even those kids who have not uh, learned, or learned to dance before all join in. And of course, we have music. We also give uh, opportunities for self-reflection. We're right next to the Gardner Museum, and so we invite the kids, the students, to go and use that as their sacred and, and safe space. Um, they have uh, their, their, their medical school card allows them free entry to the Gardner Museum. And so um, many of them use that as a space to stop and reflect. Um, fortunately, this work is, is going on nationally now. And I commend you to this new consensus report that was just written uh, last year. They pulled together a very interesting group of us uh, from higher education, from the colleges, universities, community colleges, engineers, artists, um, and physicians. And so there's a, a committee of about 20, 22 of us who came together in, in uh, Washington and came up with this consensus report that really is supporting the, the, um, how important the arts and humanities are to STEM education. So everybody has to find his own way. Um, Schweitzer said it best, everyone must find his own Lambrené. There's different ways of reaching this, this work. And um, I just want to end with this wonderful quote that he said, which is, reverence for life doesn't allow the scholar to live for his science alone, even if he is very, it's very useful to the community in so doing. It doesn't permit the artist to exist for his, only for his art, even if that gives inspiration to many by its means. It refuses to let the businessman imagine that he fulfills all legitimate demands in the course of his business activities. It demands from all that they should sacrifice a portion of their own lives for others. So the questions are, what can we do in our own communities here at Providence College, uh, across the city of, of Providence and, and, and beyond? And how can we strengthen our networks um, to continue to broaden interdisciplinary fields and really bounce back from the separation of the sciences and the arts. Uh, Picasso said, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once he grows up. This is at the Children's Hospital, actually, in Dallas. And so I thought that was so exciting that they have that. And, and it's, it's decorated with children's art. So finally, I, I just wanted to think about how Sometimes somebody leads and someone follows, and someone, sometimes someone takes up an idea and then you, you, you can either expand on it or it sounds different when it's, it's working together in collaboration with somebody else. So how many of you read music? Great. And even if you don't, you can just follow these notes. So this is a really fun little thing. Um, so Telemann wrote this piece, and Leisha and I are about to play it. It's just one piece of music, and both of us are playing it. I start one bar before Leisha, and then the magic happens. So thank you so much for being such a great audience, and we're going to just play this last piece for you.
questions um, now if anybody has any questions. And it, it, it's our custom to begin with student questions, if there are student questions. Hi, Dr. Wong. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your lecture and uh, for the music that you played. Um, so I had a question about um, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, would pertain to physicians or physicians in training. Um, so I was wondering if playing music as a physician is kind of a better complement to some specialties um, over others. Like, is it kind of easier to integrate music um, as a neuroscientist, as a psychiatrist, um, as a pediatrician, um, as opposed to someone like a surgeon or something like that? Um, or is it, you know, or is it something that can be incorporated into every specialty? And if so, how can we do that? I think it's something that's incorporated into every specialty. And that's a great question because other art forms are not quite that way, at least my, my observation of that. Um, I know that in the, in the operating rooms, uh, many surgeons play music. And I remember when I was um, doing my pediatric surgery rotation, we would spend our time challenging each other about name that tune, like which symphony are we playing right now, and, and, and things like that. So um, surgeons actually are, um, there's, there's a, quite a lot of surgeons that, because they use their hands so much, maybe it's, it's that, but there are a lot of surgeons who are musicians. And interestingly, in our orchestra, um, the wind players are mainly cancer specialists. Um, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, but the wind players are basically soloists because only, there's only two per part. And they, to be chosen to be the solo, you know, the, the principal oboist, for example, you have to play with a, a depth of heart that I, I realize that those people who are working with people um, in life-threatening situations all the time, they're able to express that even more so maybe than string players. Um, so that's, that's my thought about things. But I have seen plastic surgeons, there's a number of plastic surgeons who are wonderful sculptors um, and, and photographers because they have to be seeing th those Im images. Thank you. How many of you played music as children? Yes, and how many of you still do? Great. I've, I've actually changed my way of asking that question over time. I used to say, how many of you are musicians? And even those who sometimes have been playing music for 50 years will say, Yo-Yo Ma's a musician. I'm not a musician. I just play my, you know. And, and also, there are people who are in transition where they played music as kids, and they're in their they're, they're saying, well, they're, they're too busy at that moment to be playing, and then they come back to it later. And so that's why I, I ask if, if, if you played music as children. But I do encourage all of you to um, pick your instrument back up if you haven't already, or if you, if you don't already continue to play. It's, it's, it's really good for your brain. <laughs> Do you use um, music to actually treat patients, or does your music affect you as a person and then indirectly uh, affect how you interact with patients? Like if you're dealing with a child, are you going to uh, deal with the child by handing the child a prescription for whatever problem the child has, but the music that you've studied interacts how you talk to the child, or do you ever use music to actually try to treat a problem? Uh, yes, to all of those things. Um, when, we give sh when I give shots, we always sing Old MacDonald Had a Farm. Um, and what I do is I ask the child to choose their animal. And so they're thinking Old MacDonald Had a Farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on that farm there was a duck. And so by the time you get to quack, quack, the song is that long, but the shot is over here. So because they're thinking, they're projecting to the quack, um, we sing, oh, McDonald had a farm and the shot is gone. We, we go, yeah, yeah, ouch, sometimes. Um, and, and so that, that is one way that we do that. I've had usually, so my, my practice, Milton Pediatrics, is right at the intersection of 95, 93, and 3. So we're right there. So we have patients all the way down here in Rhode Island, all the way to the Cape, and all the way through Boston. Um, so I think I know almost all of the music programs uh, of, the, of the surrounding communities. 
So I will ask when they're going to third grade, are you starting your recorder this year? What instrument are you starting in fourth grade? Some of the, some of the programs have been moved to fifth grade now. Um, and so I, I interview, and then they say, is this my health exam? Because <laughs> I'm trying to find out about the different music programs. Um, I sing to babies when, when I'm examining them, and so they, they usually calm to the music, and then I can hear their hearts better. Um, and there are, there are opportunities to offer music for, for uh, children who are anxious and, and who are upset. And there was one time I wrote a prescription for, I had a, <laughs> I had a little patient who was a ballerina, and she was in the Nutcracker, and she was one of the um, soldiers. And you know the soldiers fight against the mice in the Nutcracker. But the mouse was really big and stepped on her foot. So she came in because she had a sore foot. And so I wrote a prescription for a smaller mouse. <laughs> Um, hi. Um, do you know if there have been any studies with this in veterinary science, in like regards to animals or anything? I don't know, and that's a really great question. That 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 is it. It, it probably is true. There are some really interesting observations of birds, because bird voice, bird sound is very much like human sound. And um, Snowball the cockatoo. Have, I don't know if you've ever seen Snowball the cockatoo, but look it up on YouTube, but it's a, it's a bird that dances in time to music, and it's, he's not the only one, but um, some of my colleagues have actually studied that this bird has about 20 different moves to music, and moves his head, or he lifts his leg, or he flaps his wings, and so, and, and so he actually seems to be consciously choosing all of these, these things to dance to. But so there, I, I think there are some studies, I haven't looked into them. In uh, human animals, is there neurobiological differences between genres, do you know? Does classical music do different things to the brain from jazz or pop genres? Yes, yes. Um, the, I think the studies are far behind the, what we will ultimately learn, because right now for functional MRI, you're in a big machine that goes clunk, clunk, clunk all the time, and so listening to music is difficult. But um, they've had studies of jazz musicians who are playing uh, jazz back and forth to the examiner, who's also a jazz musician, neuroscientist. And um, they can see the, the parts of their brain that are having conversation. And also, um, jazz musicians tend to turn off their executive function so that they can allow flow to happen. And so then, with us, you know, there's a lot of executive function going on when we're working on, like, exactly where the note is going to go. Um, but it's it's that part of the brain seems to turn off, actually, uh, in, in jazz musicians when they're, when they're playing. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I um, am a singer, and I'm in a Christmas caroling group, and we sing at nursing homes, and we um, go to the different floors, and we go to the Alzheimer's unit, mm -hmm. and often, the staff usually will tell us because we don't know the patients as well as they do, but there will be patients in the room that are not verbal. But then when we sing Silent Night, they sing along. And it can be a really moving experience, both for us and for the staff, that, that they, they can't speak. But when you sing a familiar Christmas carol, then somehow it comes back. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, um, I think that's one of those really important things, one of the reasons why we like to bring medical students to um, memory care un units before they become doctors of elders because they can see these kinds of things that happen. Um, we, played, um, we played My Fair Lady songs, and the entire room stood up and belted it out. And then the music therapist pointed out to us uh, which people were no longer able to speak, but we, we brought them back to a point where they could be happy and where they remembered that. It's, it's very important. getting a workout there. They can make them run across the room. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation, thank you so much. I have a question, you mentioned how musicians, you as a musician makes you a better doctor, how the, your colleague as a uh, writing poetry makes him a better doctor. And we know that works for other disciplines as well. Um, you mentioned the word STEM, but it's missing a letter. And yeah. some schools have STEAM to include the arts. Um, what can the medical profession do to convince legislatures and politicians and people that 
as you're discovering how important the arts are integrated into disciplines, that that needs to happen in education. Our music programs are dwindling here in Rhode Island. Most of the schools do not have string programs anymore. Um, the other music offerings are very limited. A lot of things are scheduled against it. Um, and music educators have worked very hard and diligently to try to change that. It hasn't worked. Perhaps the medical professions and leading medical institutions can make the case of how important the arts are. What, what is your take on this overall problem? I'm completely in your, in your field. I, I totally understand and I totally agree. Um, I, went to, I went to college thinking I was going to be a music teacher. Um, and, and something with children and education and health. And I ended up being a pediatrician who plays music, but it was only because I'm terrible at classroom management that I ended up that way. Um, <laughs> but, but I completely agree with you, and that is one of the things that all of us need to continue to do. And, um, you know, this bifocal thing, if we don't continue to uh, teach music and art to our children, we are not going to have doctors and scientists who are able to be flexible and, um, and create as creative and resilient as we want them to be. Um, so it feels like things are swinging back. My colleagues today, I, I'm here, so I'm not over there, but in Washington at the, um, the AAMC, which is the um, Association of Medical Colleges, they are having one of their first meetings of um, how to require arts and humanities in medical schools. So uh, we're, we're starting at that point, but I am completely with you on um, doing it in every way we can. I'm on the board of a school called the Conservatory Lab Charter School. So it's a, it's a charter school in Boston, so it's fully lottery for children from the city of Boston, and about 40% are, are African American, about 30% are uh, Latino children, and they come in by lottery but they get music, music training in orchestra every day from kindergarten through eighth grade. So um, we're trying, you know, and I think as much as a groundswell as we can for all of these things. And I always say, you know, if the, if the Congress sang first in the more <laughs> four-part harmony, like one song before they started to talk to each other, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be helpful to them all? Yeah, some kind of harmony would be helpful to all of us. It's very impressive that uh, a lot of medical professionals can find a time that works for everybody to get, get together and play music. Um, how do you all manage your, you know, just their, precisely because a lot of times people who are excellent in music ensembles are excellent at other things and have many demands on their time. Um, yes, how do you all manage to do that? <laughs> we made rules. <laughs> um, the rules are if you're going to play in the concert, there, there are certain ones that are mandatory the week of the concert and then you're only allowed to miss one or two rehearsals during the whole set. And so it's been remarkable to see what happens. If, once you put the rules down, and, and, and because before that, people would say, you know, I have to go and do a medical conference. I have to, and, and those are all very legitimate. But we'd say, I'm sorry, you can't play the Brahms. And they were like, I, I've moved my medical conference. I'll be coming in on Sunday. So people actually have changed their call schedules. They have, um, they've, they've changed their, their their teaching schedules, all kinds of things so that they can play because they realize how much it, it means to them. Uh, we've, we have people who come in and they're exhausted because they've been in the emergency room yet, or they've been telling uh, a family about a, a, a medical diagnosis and that kind of thing. And they're exhausted when they come in and by the time they leave, our rehearsals are from seven to 10 sometimes. And these are doctors who wake up for 5.30 surgeries. But they're, they're bright and alert because we're stimulating a different part of their brain. And we're working hard. We're playing like Mahler or Brahms or something. You know, and um, the more challenging, the better for them. And they, they feel much more awake and alive. So I think it's just a matter of prioritizing time. And um, Tom Sheldon, who you saw there, who's a radiation oncologist, he actually gave up the oboe for about 20 years before he um, then he read a magazine about the Longwood Symphony. He said, Oh, I forgot, I used to play the oboe. So he practiced for three years to join the orchestra. And so every morning, from six to seven o'clock in the morning, he plays in his office and then starts seeing patients. And he said, not only is he more alert, but he can palpate tumors better because he's been, um, he's woken up his fingers. 
So. We have time for one more question, and then we uh, invite you to join us in the great room uh, for uh, food and drinks and a chance to continue the conversation. It's not so much a question as a comment. When I was an undergraduate student in New York City, uh, and I am an oboist, I was invited to play with the Mount Sinai Phys Physicians Orchestra, and that was a long time ago. And I remember how much I appreciated going in, and, and I was allowed in not as a medicine person, but because they really needed an oboist. Um, but to look at many of them pretty elderly physicians, some of them very young, some of them very old, and everybody coming together and making music and watching the demeanor change, just what you say. You know, you can find time for something that is really important to you. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you everybody. This is really a wonderful opportunity to speak to you. And Thank you so much. <laughs>